Welcome everyone to today's webcast. Is your Microsoft PPM missing critical business planning and controls? My name is Ben Shamley, I'm the Chief Product and Marketing Officer here at UMT360 and I'm excited today to really show you how UMT360 can add both critical and missing financial controls uh, to Microsoft Project Online or Project Server, really helping you to build a more strategic PMO, a PMO focused on optimizing spend and maximizing ROI across your project and program investments and ultimately realizing more value from your Microsoft PPM platform uh, investment. So we look at the, the agenda for the next hour or, or, or so. Um, for those of you that have, have seen recent webcasts, the first few slides uh, may be going over old ground. We'll take a look at kind of the problem statement, what's wrong with traditional PPM and steps to ultimately build a more strategic-minded PMO. But ultimately, the main focus of today's webcast is to see the tool set in, in action. We'll see how UMT360 seamlessly extends both Project Online and Microsoft Project Server to add business planning controls uh, and financial insights across both the project and program uh, lifecycle. We'll end with benefits and, and, and next steps. Uh, a housekeeping announcement, we will be pausing at the end of today's session for Q&A, uh, so please use the GoToWebinar uh, questions and, and answers manager to post questions throughout. This will be moderated, so you may get a quick response, uh, but we will answer any questions uh, uh, as they arise at the end of the session too. So with that in mind, let's, let's jump, jump in. The truth of matter is the traditional PPM processes and tools are failing to deliver the anticipated results. The industry analysts may not necessarily agree on the exact stats, but they all agree there is an overarching problem. Standish Group still, still claim that 18% of projects fail to get implemented or delivered, and 43% of projects come in challenged, late or over budget. Gartner sees that one out of three completed projects experiences significant cost overruns. And the good old P PMI even recognized the fact that 33% of projects fail to deliver on their business objectives or goals uh, from the get-go. From our own research, and at UMT and UMT360, we've been in the project and portfolio management space really for longer than we care to remember. Uh, we see that today, a reliance on traditional PPM processes and tools could be costing your organization up to 46% of the planned business value, the value of these projects and programs uh, were uh, intending to deliver. Another way to look at that is that 46% of the investment in these strategic initiatives could be at risk. Now, of course, it's easy to throw out stats, um, but when we did this research, there were sort of three primary areas that we found uh, contributed to this value erosion. It's something we like to call the trifecta of business value uh, erosion. Now, again, we could probably spend a webcast on each one of these pillars, um, but I'm just going to go over them pretty quickly, uh, uh, but not to, 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 any, to any significant depth. The first is unreliable planning. Uh, some of the areas of concern here from the get-go is the inability really to effectively define prioritize and communicate business strategy across across the organization. Business strategy needs to be more actionable, measurable, and unique so that different departments across the organization can generate demand that ultimately is aligned with that business strategy. It still surprises me today how many organizations lack fully objective techniques to select program and, and project investments. Many organizations today are still relying on a kind of first-come, first-served basis. Obviously, that's going to impact the value of the, of the portfolio that, that's selected. Many organizations today do still have or have adopted objective techniques, um, but often these techniques uh, are simply used to, or strategy for these techniques is used to evaluate competing projects. Projects are simply generated and then evaluated against the strategy that's been defined and prioritized versus ultimately generated from that strategy or potentially the business capabilities that support that strategy. What that means is often we result in suboptimal demand, a set of projects uh, within a portfolio that are the best of a bad bunch are not fully aligned with the organizational uh, strategy. 
Another common mistake, certainly in an annual planning mode, is kind of to adopt a set it and forget it approach. Go through the, the typical annual planning life cycle, select the programs and projects, uh, and then simply deliver on them. The truth is that we're living in an environment of constant change and flux. So the ability to be able to change course throughout the year, adopt something we call dynamic planning or continuous planning is key. Poor financial insights is the next area in, in, or the next factor in the trifecta. So poor financial estimates can erode planned business value. Think early on in an annual planning process, for example, estimates can be flawed, too high, too low. This does ultimately have an impact on, the, on portfolio value. If the cost estimates are too high, when you look to optimize the portfolio under varying budget constraints, you can leave too many good projects behind. By the self-same self token, when the project estimates are too, cost estimates are too low, you often can include too many projects uh, within the uh, selected portfolio, and you'll simply have to start to cut them throughout the year uh, as uh, the, the total cost uh, overruns become apparent. The next, project cost overruns also do have a significant impact on, on portfolio value. At the portfolio level, budget is finite. If the planned projects of the portfolio start to cost more, then something has, has to give. You're going to uh, not kick off projects that you planned to undertake. You're going to have to descope projects, ultimately reducing the overall planned value from that portfolio. One of the key areas we found was ineffective budget utilization, with many organizations failing to spend all the allocated budget uh, for that planning year. Could be for a variety of reasons. Resource shortfalls, meaning you didn't kick off projects when you expected to, to kick them off. Unplanned carryovers, projects slipping from one fiscal period to another. You, know, take, you don't spend the money in, that, in, the, in the initial fiscal period. Worse still, you, ha you erode budget from the next planning period, and the value is deferred. But the overarching concern that we found was actually poor forecasting capabilities. We have often project managers holding funds hostage, um, you know, almost as their, their own area to hold funds for their own, uh, for, for, you know, in, case the, in case they needed it down, down the line, and, and weren't freeing that money up so it could be reinvested across the portfolio to maximize value and optimize spend. The last area and factor is a lack of portfolio visibility. We have to recognize the fact that projects and programs don't exist in a vacuum. They're funded to make change to an organization, onboard a new capability, um, make an enhancement to an IT asset or product. By understanding this enterprise connections, we get more visibility across all portfolio activities. We're able to do things like more easily identify redundancy, for example, if we see that projects, uh, two project requests are impacting the same business capability, maybe they're duplicate, and we can kill them earlier and free up the funds uh, to invest in additional projects. Another area is that we're, by being able to look across silo domains, being able to see the impact that a project has on an IT asset like an application, in turn, the impact that IT asset has on a business, cap you know, on business capability or process. We're able to very quickly see the upstream and downstream impact of any proposed change and make changes quicker. So those are sort of three reasons that could result in your organization losing up to 46% of the planned business value from their project and program portfolios. If that's not bad enough, uh, many PMOs today are sort of have this nightmare of disconnected process and tools, which is hampering their their efficiency. When we think about the sort of core PPM processes that the PMO manages, could be the upfront demand management process, portfolio selection and analysis, uh, the ongoing recurring status reporting, and even beyond the life of the, uh, the project benefits realization, often these PPM processes are supported by multiple and often disconnected tools. This simply means that the PMO spends too much time manually reconciling data building reports, that time, if freed up, could actually be dedicated to more strategic activities, like identifying problems, taking corrective, corrective action. Again, when we think about demand management, demand can jump, can spring from anywhere. Could be an email request, could be captured in, in a SharePoint list. 
course, captured in, in Project Online and Project Server 2. When you start to look at the sort of fundamental elements of a business case, cost-benefit analysis may be stored in Excel. Descriptive information about that project could be housed in Word. That project could be presented to steering committees in a PowerPoint form. This, often this information needs to be manually collected uh, and maintained. The same holds true for the recurring status reporting process. Simply being able to better um, reconcile information from, let's say, an ERP system for actual costs and integrate with that PPM system is key. So bringing information together, automating and streamlining often manual processes is simply going to help the PMO to become more efficient and free up time uh, to focus on identifying problems and taking corrective action. So there are a number of polls today, I think three polls. This is the first. Um, the question is, we just went, we, we just went through the 46 percent of value erosion and the efficiency problems. Which of these keeps you up at night for your PMO? And the questions are, inability to reclaim lost business value from projects and programs, so that relates to that 46 percent problem we were talked about. The inefficiency problem, your PMO is spending too much time manually reconciling information, building reports, uh, taking the focus off strategic activities, both of these or neither of these. So we'll let this run for 15 seconds or so, and then we'll close the polls. So we can close the polls. Okay, so we've got seven. I'll take, I'll take this in kind of reverse order here. We have seven percent on on none of these. I'll be interested to to learn more about what factors are are keeping you up at night. Um, Five percent that really are concerned by the loss of business value from ineffective project and program uh, selection and delivery. 38% um, 30, uh, focus more on needing to ensure the PMO moves from tactical into more strategic activities. And the most 50% that really is uh, trying to address both factors, the value erosion as well as the efficiency problem. That's great. So let's move on. So one of the overarching problems that we've found is a lot of times traditional PMOs historically have been more focused on what we, we think we call execution orientated activities. These are obviously important activities, schedule management, time reporting, team collaboration, uh, and, and, and other aspects. But I think we've reached a point now where PMO needs to become more strategic in their outlook. We simply have to acknowledge the fact that projects and programs at their core are business investments and we need to treat them as such. And in turn, the PMO needs to become more strategic and take responsibility for optimizing spend and ultimately, ultimately maximizing value across uh, their projects and program portfolios. So you may have seen incarnations of this slide from us before, but we see really there are sort of three core steps to becoming a more strategic minded PMO. Now, of course, this assumes that you have a base level of execution under your belt uh, already. The first step is to recognize the efficiency problem, that disconnected tools and manual processes is hampering your PMO performance. By consolidating all information in your PPM planning and execution system, all salient information that's going to help you make business decisions, and looking to streamline and automate key processes like, uh, like status reporting, demand management, and, and others is going to make your PMO more efficient and as we said, free up time to be more strategic. Having got that core data set in play, we can then look at gaining greater financial and strategic insights. Insights we ultimately need to make better business decisions on these strategic investments. We'll look at concepts around multi-year planning, 
We'll look at how to drive better annual planning. We'll take a, a brief look as well at moving to a dynamic planning uh, philosophy and how different metrics and data can be provided to support decisions in those different planning cadences. And last, but by no means least, and it's not an area we're going to focus on too much today, the next is going back to that connected portfolios. Again, acknowledging the fact that managing projects and programs is only one aspect of ensuring that all execution in an organization is aligned with strategic priorities. We must understand that these projects and programs impact other other portfolios in our organization, business capabilities, IT assets, product portfolios. And by understanding those interrelationships and important cross-portfolio dependencies, as a PMO, we get greater enterprise visibility. And we can understand the sort of not upstream and downstream impact of proposed changes. And in turn, get visibility across all spend, both operational uh, and discretionary or strategic spend. So what is key is the ability now to integrate business planning and controls across the traditional PPM lifecycle. We'll take a look at a sort of quick process flow first, and then we'll look at how this can be achieved within the Microsoft PPM, uh, PPM platform. So there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. Today we're really going to take a look at how you can better harmonize program and project investments to establish the business planning controls across the PPM lifecycle. But again, there are different approaches that, can, that you, can, you can apply here. This tends to be approach used by many of, our, many of our customers. So here we see sort of key phases across the project and program lifecycle. Create, allocate, plan, manage, evaluate. And let's break this down in terms of what happens. The first really addresses the kind of multi-year planning cadence. So the ability to be able to define and prioritize a good set of business drivers at the right level of detail and effectively communicate them across the organization. Business strategy with a three to five year outlook. Next, the ability to uh, break down key investment programs that will be key to delivering on the strategy that has been defined and prioritized. So starting at a, a program investment hub level, so the ability to define these investment programs, capture the right descriptive data, obviously do the cost and benefit analysis, look at the strategic impact assessment that ultimately is going to help you to effectively evaluate these competing programs and allocate the appropriate funds based on the, on the perceived contribution. And more effectively, build and communicate multi-year roadmaps for the executive team. Having looked at the create and allocate, which tends to be more of a sort of multi-year focus, we can move into more of an annual planning cadence. This is where we can decompose down to the project level, break down the project that we expect to be delivered within that planning horizon, uh, and of course relate back to the overarching investment programs or themes. So again, build out business cases for the projects, programs, uh, but the important thing is tying them back to the program. So we have a direct connection from project to program to ultimately the strategic priorities uh, that's going to be the focus for the next three to five years. In that planning phase, of course, you may look again to re-optimize the portfolio, allocate funds, and ultimately sequence the projects based on uh, available resources. Having stepped through the planning stage, we're going to move into execution or management. This also introduces the final planning cadence, the cadence of, of uh, ongoing or continuous, something we refer to as dynamic planning. So the ability to effectively automate and streamline project and program status reporting. Uh, that results also in management of scope changes or change requests if you need more money there are fundamental changes to the, pro to, to the project or program. And it introduces the concept as well of rebalancing the portfolio throughout the year. So providing the steering committee with the insights needed to understand when to kill a project. If there's available budget, do I invest more in existing projects? Do I bring in net new projects from my pipeline? And what impact is that having on my overall budget utilization uh, as well as the overall portfolio value uh, that will be delivered. 
And last but by no means least, and maybe we'll have time to touch on this today briefly, is evaluate. Obviously, beyond the, the life of the project and program, we may want to garner information around lessons learned. Certainly want to look at establishing benefits realization framework that allow us to track uh, the, uh, the results and understand whether the projects and programs delivered on their intended goals. An area we won't touch on today, uh, again, goes back to that connected portfolio concept. The ability then to uh, connect these projects ultimately to the IT assets and business assets they're impacting and start in turn to apply business planning and controls to these assets. So concepts of asset portfolio management. So that's what we're going to step through today. We're going to take a look at some of these concepts inside uh, Project Online and Project Server with UMT360 helping to add uh, the critical financial information uh, required. I think one of the key takeaways for me will be, as we step through this dem demonstration, 360 is so well integrated with Microsoft PPM solution that you won't be able to see where UMT360 stops and project server starts and, and vice versa. So what I'm going to do is, is to endeavor to step through uh, a few of those stages at a high level. So I'm going to switch to the demonstration now. Here we're looking at uh, UMT360 working on top of uh, a project server 2013 uh, environment. The first thing to note about UMT360 is a SharePoint application with seamless integration uh, with, with Microsoft Project. Now, what I'm going to do is start uh, as per the first phase of um, Crate there, uh, looking at the program level. So by clicking on the program management tile now, I'm going to be routed to an overarching dashboard uh, that is summarizing the key programs uh, uh, that are for consideration. Now, obviously, for those of you familiar with Microsoft Project, you have the ability to define and prioritize business strategy. First chart here is really showing those prioritized uh, business drivers, but out the allocated spend shown proportionally against those business drivers. So it's very easy to see, you know, based on the demand or the programs that we have uh, in, in for consideration or already in play, uh, how well aligned the investment in these programs is with the business strategy. So we have a problem the bottom here with investment, uh, too, too much investment in lower priority drivers, maybe we need to um, re-optimize to a degree to get better support uh, to the higher business drivers. This view here is simply showing, again, by business driver, how many programs we currently have in play relating to each business driver. You can quickly see the forecasted spend uh, by program across the next three or four uh, three, or, three or four years. So we're looking at this sort of multi-year planning concept, which allows us to quickly generate things like program portfolio roadmaps and understand which projects are already committed, or programs, sorry, are already committed and in flight, which ones are still considered for the pipeline. So the concept of rolling up to, uh, to the strategy level, the program level, looking at multi-year roadmaps is key. So as we move into more of sort of annual planning discussion, we can drill down into the current year, in this case, 2016 and look at just the investments considered for this year, again, looking at a spend alignment or investment alignment with the strategy, uh, as well as understanding um, you know, what the key benefits of these projects will be delivered based on this pie chart here. We can see the spend, the, again, the spend breakdown for the year uh, based on the projects and programs uh, that are supporting. Uh, and here we get more of a tabular view uh, in regards to sort of key metrics around these programs. So what I'm going to do now is drill down into a program that has just been uh, initiated, which is in the early stage of, of its uh, business case definition. So I'm drilling down now into the SharePoint rollout program. And the first thing to note is some of the key metrics and views that are summarized here in the program summary report, summary report shown directly within uh, that program record. So looking at things like integrated cost and benefit analysis, obviously using that to automatically derive key financial metrics like uh, ROI, NPV, and, and others. But because we're able to assess the impact of this program against the strategy that's been defined and prioritized, we can use that instantaneously to derive our overall strategic value score. And in turn, we use that to calculate a very important metric for us, strategic yield, which is the, va the strategic value of the, of the program divided by, its, at this stage, its cost estimates, which gives us an overall yield score for this particular program. 
You'll see how we use strategic yield throughout. We use it in upfront evaluation of projects and programs in more of a multi-year and annual planning uh, concept. We also use yield throughout the year to understand the sort of ongoing investment viability of one project versus another, because it is a dynamic metric, a metric comprised of value and cost. So if cost changes, if, if the project's more expensive, for example, and the value stays the same, the yield will automatically degrade, alerting you of, of potential investment viability problems. We see other metrics like risk here, for example. We can also see important organizational budgeting information. Who's down to um, fund this particular program? Here we see it's being funded by four organizations. Uh, and other information around uh, payback based on cumulative cost and benefit uh, analysis. So let's take a look at how the information can be maintained. So here we see uh, a, a simple workflow that's controlling this program throughout its life through the upfront create, allocate, plan, manage, and evaluation portion of the program of the program's uh, life. Now with UMT360 on top of Project Server, you get the ability to add a lot of additional uh, workflow controls directly to uh, the workflow authoring tool, SharePoint Designer, so that you can start to manage projects and programs from an investment point of view. Controls like uh, automatically taking snapshots of, of projects and programs at different stages in their life, making sure you're recording the right financial information at different stages in the project's life, uh, and controls like this workflow visualization that you see here. So as you can see that we're early on in this program's life, we're in the defined stage. Um, obviously, uh, I'm not going to take credit for the program details form here. This is coming directly from uh, Microsoft Project Server with key enterprise custom fields. Um, but why, why I'm showing you this is simply the rest of these forms are coming from UMT360. Uh, and it's simply a recognition of the fact of the seamless UI integration. When you uh, install UMT360 or deploy UMT360, really it's like your project and program teams can take advantage of a whole additional capabilities and it's seamless uh, to the Microsoft UI. So training uh, uh, impact is minimized. So what we want to do is move away from capturing financial information in Excel, where it's disconnected, difficult to govern, and start to centralize all critical information within our planning and execution system, in this case, uh, Microsoft Project Server 2013. So the ability to be able to come in here and capture cost estimates at the right granularity. Here, through the workflow, we're simply asking information to be captured at a yearly granularity at this stage, and in this case, level four within within the financial structure that has been defined in the tool. You're in full control in terms of the financial structures that, that, are, that are defined. But again, I could capture information at any level of detail I wanted. So I could go to the quarterly granularity if that uh, was applicable at this stage in the project's life. So just like Excel, it's pretty easy to come in here and add financial information, capture cost estimates, cut and paste, drag and, drag and drop. But of course, we also want to integrate and capture uh, resource costs uh, without having to, to sort of double enter this information. So this symbol here simply represents the fact that the labor costs here are being dynamically aggregated from project server, either from the resource plan or from the schedule itself. It's too early in the life of this program for, uh, for a schedule. So these, uh, these costs, labor cost estimates are actually coming natively from uh, the resource plan in, uh, in project. So here you see the, the skills that I think that are required for this program, the FT requirements, and they were translating into cost. Now, when I showed you the program summary report, we we're also able to go beyond the total cost of this program to understand who ultimately is going to be funding this program. So the ability now to break down the different funding sources, in this case, IT, finance, operations, and marketing, the four funding areas for this particular program. And there's costs are being broken down on a percentage uh, on a percentage basis. So the ability to centralize cost estimates, so it's in, they're instantly governable, instantly reportable, are, are key. The same can be said about uh, financial or non-financial benefits. Again, we want to be able to standardize the financial structures and govern the completion of the information at the appropriate stage in the project's life cycle. So when we looked at total cost and benefit estimates in that program summary report and some of the resulting metrics, they're being derived directly from this base data. But next, we may want to go beyond to, to derive additional scores that are going to help us evaluate the programs. So when we looked at that business 
um, driver or strategy bar chart earlier, uh, this is where we can do an assessment of how this program will contribute to the business strategy uh, defined and prioritized in Project Server. So a simple survey here that ultimately is allowing us to capture the impact that this program will have on the different business drivers that have been defined here, like expand new markets and segments, increase market share, and so on, and capture the contribution is key. But what, what is critical is the, to automatically derive the strategic value score. Here you see a score of 93, and again, in turn, that was used to derive that strategic yield score or their investment viability score by taking the value divided by the cost, information that's being maintained uh, natively in this record. The survey infrastructure allows you to, quite honestly, generate any uh, evaluation score. So here's an example of a risk assessment that's simply been generated at the program level to let, to let us calculate an overall risk score, business risk, technology risk, however you want to factor that score. So really the survey capabilities are the kind of gift that keeps on giving throughout um, the evaluation and, and deriving uh, metrics for uh, the different projects and programs. So we've captured the upfront program in the system. If I was to submit this program, again, we're obviously going to move this on to the next stage, which is uh, allocate in, the, in this particular dem demonstration. And this is where the programs will be reviewed in bulk uh, and funds will be allocated to, to the programs. One of the benefits, again, of, uh, of UMT360 is the ability to automatically trigger actions based on transitions from one workflow stage to, to the other. Now, if my demonstration environment plays ball, we'll, we will, we'll move into the, the program review stage. The reason I'm showing this is simply being able to trigger things like snapshots is a great win. So you can see now, if I go to the cost estimates, this, this web part now cannot be edited. But also, as I've transitioned into this decision point, we're able to take an auditable snapshot at any level, program or project, to, to take a snapshot of the financial and other metadata uh, pertaining to this investment. And, we can, and those snapshots can be used over time for reporting purposes as the, estimates, uh, as the estimates evolve. So here we see a snapshot automatically taken, and it's snapshotted both the program and cost information at that time in the project's life, or the program's life in this case. OK, so what I'm going to do next is move on later in the program's life. So we're actually going to open up a program now that is in the next stage plan and manage, or, or the track phase. So for that, I'm just going to quickly jump to the program center here and pick up the global innovation program. So I'm opening up a global innovation program, which is further on in the life. Now, what's key to note is, is um, now we see additional PDPs or forms at this stage. We started to introduce the concept of associations. Now we're also going to start to break down or decompose projects to different levels uh, to the different level and then associate back to the programs. So we need a way of managing those cross-portfolio uh, or inter-portfolio dependencies. So here we see all the additional projects here, or all the projects that are ultimately mapping back to my program, the Global Innovation Program. Uh, we also can use that relationship to start to dynamically aggregate financial information. So when I look at things like project costs now, at that program level, we have a direct aggregation of the underlying bottom-up project costs, whether it's the cost estimates from, from the supporting projects, forecast information, actual costs coming from the projects, all aggregated to the corresponding program level. And the same is true for benefits. What that gives us the ability to do now is start to bring together both top-down allocation or budget information at the program level and compare and contrast with bottom-up coming from the underlying projects. Rather than looking at it in a tabular form, I will spend a bit of time looking at the program status report. If I generate this program status report, uh, there's lots of different views that we can drill into. I'm just going to open up the cost status, uh, which basically is summarizing both the top-down allocation and the bottom-up allocation rolled up from, from the underlying, uh, underlying project. So we have our program budget here, top-down, compared to our project budget. But more importantly, almost, we can actually see where the different projects are in, in, in their life cycle. So the idea now is to break down and capture new projects 
uh, that will be uh, associated to, to, to this project, as well as manage the projects that are ongoing associated to this, to this program. So if I drill down into the innovation management framework, which is actually a project in its pipeline, which means in this particular demonstration environment, it's in its early stages of its business case. It hasn't been approved yet. We can see the business case infrastructure uh, that can be established for the project proposal. So we're in the defined stage, have the ability now to start to break down project cost and benefit estimates in the same way that we did for, uh, for program cost and benefit estimates, score projects from multiple dimensions, generate reports, but ultimately based on those associations, this project is being tied back to this global innovation program and that's how we're dynamically aggregating the bottom-up financial information. So bringing in new pipeline requests and associating back to, to the program. By the same self-token, if I actually look at a project that's committed, meaning that's in flight, we can see the status of that project too. So drilling down from the program back to, or to the health assessment reporting tool project, we can see through the workflow graphic this project is further on in its life, in its execute stage. Uh, and uh, additional information is being captured, cost actual information, cost forecast information, and in turn that was aggregated back to the corresponding program. We're going to come back and look at this project in more detail from a financial status reporting point of view uh, in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a second. The only other point to note at the program level, being able to dynamically generate uh, roadmaps at any level within the system is key. So with 360, here we can quickly generate a roadmap, just showing a summary information about what is impacting this particular program. We're looking at the Global Innovation Program at the bottom of our roadmap here. This is the program that we're currently in. Uh, and we can see the different projects in Project Server that are associated and where they are in their life cycle and get salient information about those projects from within the roadmap. And this can be generated at any level in the portfolio hierarchy that you establish, portfolio, program, project, sub-project, and so on. So next, let's take a look really at starting to more move into the manage and execute phase and track financial performance and look at some of the sort of foundations needed to move to more of a dynamic planning uh, philosophy. So for that, I'm actually going to generate uh, one of the dashboards here. Start with cost tracking. And this is actually giving us a sort of financial picture of in-flight projects and programs. So just the program, programs and projects that, that are in-flight. Uh, and this view is simply rolled up by funding source or, or department. And here we're, we're seeing both bottom-up information and top-down. So the ability to be able to understand based on the committed projects what our variance is, forecast against plan or budget from bottom-up, as well as looking at from the top-down. What, what funds have been allocated to each department is what's shown in the top table. Also the ability to be able to quickly aggregate at any level in the hierarchy to understand cumulative a budget actual forecast is key. If we look at this chart here, we can see there is a budget utilization problem. Uh, to date, our actuals are, are under our plan and we're forecasting, uh, the forecast is less than the plan too. So there's an opportunity to start to reallocate funds because uh, we we're going to have an issue of a budget utilization shortfall. Uh, you can drill down to quickly identify variants. What UMT360 is going to help you do on top of Project Server and Project Online is automate status reporting uh, and dynamically generate variance analysis. And this, this really forms the foundation of our dynamic planning process. So we look to group projects into three camps. The first and probably the most obvious are the ones that have a positive variance, so forecast greater than, than plan. And we're going to make some decisions on these investments. Now, are we going to give them more money? Are we going to approve more funds? Are we going to descope? Are we going to cancel? But it's too early to make those decisions just yet. We also want to take a look at the opposite, the projects that are showcasing an underspend, where forecast is less uh, than plan. Because ultimately, we want this money to be freed up quickly throughout the year. This goes back to that continuous planning concept. We want that money to be freed up and reallocated by the steering committee. And we're going to make decisions here. When to give more money to existing in-flight projects that require it, and when to bring in net new projects from the pipeline with the goal of two things, optimizing spend and also maximizing the value for that planning period. 
But we also want to put projects on a watch list. And these are the ones that are showcasing what we like to call a potential underspend. These are the projects where year to date or to date, the projects are under budget, but yet the PM is forecasted they will spend all the money by the end of the year or, or, or the end, end of the project. And ultimately, these projects are the ones that often result in Q4 budget utilization problems, where you know the, the project manager throws his or her hands up in the air, says, I'm just not going to spend the money. And from a PMO and steering committee point of view, there's no real time in that fiscal period to react, reallocate the funds to better utilize them and maximize value within that planning period. So again, the ability to simply break down these projects into, this, uh, into these views is key. And you'll see how uh, we provide some analysis in terms of helping support those decisions in a second. But now if we drill down into one of the projects which we looked at some moments ago, health assessment reporting, uh, we'll actually see an overview dashboard of the overall performance of this project. Now this project was uh, over budget. So you can actually see here from one of the metrics perspective, it's actually 32% over, over budget. But notice now how we're starting to use this strategic yield metric. We didn't just use it in the upfront planning, annual planning, to look at the kind of bang for the buck of each in, in investment. We're using it as an investment viability indicator throughout the life of the project or investment. For example, here, the cost of this project has risen 32%. Value has stayed the same. So the yield has instantly degraded. There's a 24% drop in yield, which is simply a leading indicator uh, that may highlight the fact that the investment viability for this project is not once what it was, uh, and therefore there may be an opportunity to, to make a decision, bring in a new project, reallocate the funds. But anyway, it gives you that sort of early warning uh, indicator. But it's also bringing together other information that you would expect across the project, schedule information, resource information, and so on. But from a financial perspective, obviously we can get a lot deeper, drilling down into the overall cost status for this particular project, obviously looking at cumulative spend patterns, monthly spend patterns, burn down rates, variance analysis is, is, is key. Now you can get as deep as you like in terms of looking at uh, the additional metrics from a budget actuals forecast perspective, you know, looking at year to, year to date to dates, total forecasts, and understanding where the project is. So all this information is integrated within your planning and execution system. So if we look at how these reports or how the information for, for these reports is being maintained and drill back down to the project level, we're in the health assessment reporting tool project and we're in the execute stage. So when we moved from the final decision point here into execute, the budgets were dynamically locked. We can see we have approved budget here, approved benefits. And now we want to start to look at tracking financial performance. As mentioned, UMT360 provides an integrated way of streamlining financial status reporting. So here now, I presented uh, an actual cost tracking web part where we're going to track the cost, in this case on a monthly cadence, pertaining to this, this project. There's three ways of getting cost information in here. First, and I don't recommend this, is manually. You simply present, you know, let the project manager update the information manually. The second, and happens 95% of the time, uh, is integrated with your ERP system. So being able to pull in the committed cost for a period from your ERP system with our ERP integration tool. We have a, 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 what we call a data exchange module that integrates with SAP, PeopleSoft, and, and others to be able to pull that information in from the ERP system so it's presented to the project manager when he or she is doing their, their status reports. So we have to capture the actuals is, 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 is obviously important. We also want to get that variance analysis, the forecast information. So being able to maintain estimates to complete, again, within the project record within project server is key. So all past periods here are locked, and open periods can be, can be edited. Now, as a PMO, you have the ability to manage the reporting periods. So if I go back to the cost actual view here, we can see they're actually in an open period for July. Uh, but the past periods have already been locked. So as a PMO, you can open the next reporting period. In this case, we're, we're reporting on a monthly cadence. P uh, project managers are notified, complete the status report, uh, and then the status report can be locked, and the information is then archived for reporting purposes. So I simply do that by submitting, submitting it here. Now, 
as part of our status reporting period, this project was running 32% over budget. So you may want to raise a change request to request more funds. So if I go to the approved budget here, uh, I'm not going to do this in full. We can come in pretty quickly, create a change request, and request more money for this particular project. Based on time, what I'm going to do is cheat. I'm simply going to copy the information from my forecast table to my budget. So I'm going to attempt to overwrite my budget with the forecast data or the estimates to complete that's being maintained. The tool's going to tell me a uh, good try, but uh, this budget is so the budget for this project is locked. Uh, you're going to have to raise a change. Uh, I'm going to raise a change request automatically for you to request additional funds. So the change request has been raised here, and based on the governance processes, will be routed for approval. If approved, uh, the budget will be updated. If rejected, an auditable record will be maintained. I'm not going to go too much deeper into change requests, but the reason I went into change requests is because change requests basically are the foundation for dynamic planning. We're now going to aggregate the change requests, whether people are requesting more money, or what we call redirects, or even giving money back from projects through kind of negative change requests. Uh, and I'm going to show you that uh, in, in a second. But remember, this project ultimately was associated with that global innovation program. So all, all this financial information maintained at the project level is also aggregated back to, to, to the program level. So if I look at the program status report now, we don't just get you know, RAG indicators at the project level, they can also be derived at the program level, as you see here. We can see how the health of the underlying underlying projects. And we also got to look, I showed you before, the sort of overall financial performance of the underlying projects shown through, uh, through the cost status. Now, to give a little bit of insight into uh, the dynamic planning process, if I generate the change request analysis view, we want to aggregate all the change requests that have been captured across the reporting period. Uh, so this view here is simply taking a look at both my, what we call redirects, requests for more money, as well as the releases. Project managers are releasing funds to be reallocated across the portfolio. So this is breaking down both our releases. Here we see the project that are actually giving back money here. This is actually totaling around $407,000 worth of money being given back, which can be reallocated, as well as the redirects, the projects that have created positive change requests to request more money. So in this case, you can see that there's $790,000 worth of additional funds being requested from these, from these existing projects. Now, this information is dynamically aggregated, and these reports then can be used by the steering committee to make investment decisions. So should we invest more in these existing projects versus bringing in net new projects from the pipeline? So if we look at the metrics here, we can see that our total budget for our portfolio is $20.5 million. Our current committed budget for the portfolio is $17.8 million. So we already have a budget utilization problem. The additional budget requested is actually our redirects, the, the positive change request, less the, the, the releases, money being given back. So there's a $383,000 of additional funds being requested which would give us, if we approve that, uh, a total adjusted budget of 18.2, which is still under uh, the organizational budget for the year. So we do have uh, still a budget utilization problem. So really, there's no reason why we wouldn't necessarily want to approve these additional funds. But we can also look at it from a, from a value point of view. What's interesting here is based on the 17.8 million, our current yield for the portfolio is 101.59. But actually, if we were to approve uh, these additional funding requests, that yield increases. It increases because the, re the projects that are releasing funds, their overall yield has improved more than the yield of the projects uh, that are uh, requesting more funds because of the value cost paradigm. Um, now, additional views you may want to generate and look at is, OK, well, should we invest more in these existing projects, or should we start taking a look at other projects in, in the pipeline? So, this view simply stack ranks all investments, both our in-flight projects that are requesting more money with projects in our pipeline that haven't been approved yet, and uses strategic yield, as you see here, to simply draw the line. So we can see where we start to run out of funds. So this is where we run out of the, the available funds, uh, this line here, just around print advertising campaign system. And, and based on the tool's recommendation, it's actually recommending that we can invest more in these three 
projects, committed projects were in flight, but we should also bring in a pipeline project. And again, if we do that, that will maximize the overall yield from the portfolio, uh, as well as optimizing the overall spend. So I think that's about as far as I'm going to take this, this demonstration. No time to, to drill down into uh, benefits realization, but the same way that you're able to track project costs through the life, you can also establish a benefits realization framework at the project and program level uh, to track actual a and report on actual benefits. So if I go back to the slides, we have two quick polls. The first is, how do you integrate critical cost and benefit data with Project Online and Project Server today? And the options you have here is, is we rely on custom fields and, and, and resource assignments. Uh, we manage cost and benefits sort of within, within Excel. We, we're going to rely on our ERP systems with sort of reporting to bridge the gap between our PPM and ERP systems. And we have a built a custom solution or purchased off the shelf solution such as uh, UMT 360. Uh, we don't currently uh, look at cost and benefit information today, but um, this is uh, within our own PPM roadmap, so we're planning to. So we'll shut the polls in in the next uh, 10 seconds or so. Another five seconds. Oh, that was a long five seconds. Another five seconds, and we'll, we'll shut the polls. So what we see here, it's surprising me to, to well, one, one part of this surprises me, 0% relying on, on custom fields and, and task assignments. I normally see that being uh, you know, definitely a, a technique that 20% of organizations are, are utilizing today when managing financial information at a kind of high level or at a very detailed level within the project schedule itself. Uh, certainly not surprised to see that Excel is is being used in this regard. Um, that that certainly is is, is is the same for a lot of organisations. A few relying on the ERP system with, with six percent, uh, ten percent of invested in customization or potentially an off-the-shelf uh, solution, and a, a good healthy number looking to uh, better integrate financials uh, within their PPM environment uh, in in the future. Um, so hopefully, uh, where these, the, you guys won't invest in custom solutions. You know there are solutions out there that, that can can help uh, fulfill that role pretty quickly. So next, uh, if we move on, question: Does your organisation manage both programs and projects? So, and we just stepped through one example of of, of establishing a model for better managing business planning controls at the program level and project level. But who here is managing both programs and projects? So yes, we manage both programs and projects in our organization, or we're just managing projects only today, um, or we only manage projects, but we're planning to, to sort to develop that sort of program investment hub in the future. So another five seconds and we'll shut the bolt. So pretty unanimous, 71% uh, are managing, as, as uh, we see, uh, programs and projects. Uh, uh, only 3% just focus on the project level because 26% uh, of you may only be at the project level today, but are planning to also introduce the concept of programs soon. So that, that, that's great. So back to the slides. Now, I know we're short on time, so I'll wrap this up um, pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. So what I think we just saw, uh, and again, the demonstration itself in its beauty was kind of more tactical, tactically orientated, the ability to seamlessly integrate critical financial controls within the project and program lifecycle within, within the Microsoft PPM system. So to the end user, uh, it feels like uh, the, the capabilities are coming natively from uh, the tool that they used to, Project Online or Project Server. Now, what we found is by adopting some of these capabilities, and we didn't go through all of these, these today, of course, we looked at that 46% loss in business value. So addressing some of those factors that fall, 
fell part of the trifecta of business value erosion, can actually help you reclaim up to 35% of the lost business value from your project and program investments. Now, that's part of the robust planning in terms of building a better definition and prioritization of, of, of strategy, looking to, to uh, generate programs directly related to the strategy, look at more effective budget allocation at the program level. But more importantly, moving to more of this dynamic planning for a philosophy that we just touched on very lightly. Of course, getting financial insight from integrated financial information within your planning and execution system is key. I'm not going to go through all of these, but we touched on some of those. We didn't look at the concept of portfolio integration today, going beyond project and programs into understanding uh, how these investments impact other key enterprise portfolios. But again, that's another concept. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that you'll be able to claim back all the 46% of lost value. Obviously, projects will continue to fail. They'll continue to have cost overruns, and that will impact uh, your overall portfolio value. Um, but what we've seen is you can claim up to around 35%. Now, that being said, we looked at that other problem in terms of the PMO efficiency. By looking to consolidate information, as I hope you saw, within your planning and execution system, to be able to get better govern that information, automate key processes, whether that's demand management, whether that's, um, whether that's the ongoing status reporting, uh, will actually make your PMO more efficient, will ensure uh, that you can uh, free up more time to focus on more strategic activities and optimize spend and maximize value across your project and program uh, uh, in, in investments. So we get, make your PMO on average around 26% more efficient. So again, we looked at uh, project and 360 working in, in harmony. As I said, it's almost invisible in terms of where project st stops and UMT 360 starts. But here is a sort of breakdown of where uh, no, the, the role the project was playing and the role that UMT 360 was playing. When it comes to strategy definition and prioritization, key aspect of, of, uh, of Microsoft project or your UMT 360 is extending in terms of being able to do, do impact assessments on, uh, on the business strategy and derive overall absolute priority scores. We saw both tools being adding to the governance processes. I'm not going to read through all of these, uh, but I'll leave it up on the screen for a while. UMT 360 providing that integrated cost and benefit management capability, project server still providing robust resource management capabilities, and, and the list goes on here. So I'd like to thank you for your time. I know we're, we're, we're up on, 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 on the hour. Um, we will pause for, for a Q&A, but before we, I, I, I do kind of sign off uh, and start to take some of the questions that, that, uh, that have arisen, uh, there are potential next steps. I mean, if you want to learn more about how easy it is to integrate the critical business and financial controls within your project online or project server environment, simply contact us. We can establish very quickly an envisioning workshop uh, and understand your requirements and really show you um, how you can quickly and easily extend your existing environment to get more value from it. Uh, we also offer a 30-day proof of concept environment, the ability to try before you, you buy. And this is not necessarily a free trial environment. We will work with your team to understand your processes, to show you how quickly 360 can be applied to your existing environment to achieve some of the things that we looked at today. Uh, and of course, there's different ways you can get going. If you've got project server on-prem, UMT 360 uh, extends that environment pretty quickly. If you're a project online, you can get started in our hosted environment very quickly too, UMT 360 online. So three different things to, to consider. So that being said, um, I want to thank you for your time today. I know we're, we're just over the hour. Um, uh, please look out for additional webcasts coming from the UMT 360 team over the next uh, quarter. And we'll pause now for any questions that were, were, were answered or were asked during, during the, the process.